Mike from Susanville, California asked the question, are you allowed to include pictures in a provisional patent application instead of drawings? Mike, thanks for the question. The short answer is yes. You can use photographs to substitute for drawings or figures in a provisional patent application. Recall that a provisional patent application is never actually examined unless you need to prove the priority date of your invention. That is, in case you need to prove at some future time that you actually knew what the invention was at the time that you filed your provisional patent application. If you do decide to use photographs in your provisional patent application, it's really helpful if the photographs are clear and well lit, they're in focus, and any writing in the photographs should be clear and legible. Photographs can be an excellent way to illustrate and demonstrate your invention, especially if you have a prototype. I did a detailed video several years ago on the topic, so you might go to YouTube and search for the video, How to Get a Provisional Patent Application on File Fast. I take a deeper dive into the topic on that video. Next question, Adolfo asks the question, can you register a song in another language? And the answer is yes, you can register a song with the United States Copyright Office in a foreign language, in a language other than English. There is no requirement that songs be in English. Copyright protection applies equally to all languages. However, the Copyright Office may require that the title of the song be listed in English as well as in the original language. Okay, this next one is a comment by Invention Shield. And this is Steve Acock, who's an attorney, a patent attorney in Florida. And Steve points out that one additional reason that I've used provisional patent applications is when an inventor may be trying to decide whether to patent something or keep it as a trade secret. The provisional gets the priority date with confidentiality and no publication, so it gives some time to decide about the trade secret route. This comment was left on a video where I listed five reasons why you might want to file a provisional patent application. And I actually hadn't considered trade secrets when I was putting together this video. What Steve is suggesting is that by filing a provisional patent application, you're writing down the invention, you're making a record of what your invention is. And even though you file your provisional patent application, the contents of your patent application are never actually disclosed to the public unless within 12 months you decide to convert your provisional patent application to a non-provisional application. So during this 12-month period, your provisional patent application contents are actually a trade secret. You've proven the date that you had the trade secret, and unless you share the contents of that provisional patent application with a third party, or you decide to convert that provisional patent application to a non-provisional patent application, it will never be disclosed. So in the event that you ever have to litigate for theft of that trade secret, you can use the provisional patent application document and the receipt that you receive when you file the provisional patent application as the positive and important proof that you in fact had the trade secret as of a certain date. Thanks Steve for pointing this out. I'll have to add it to my next trade secret video. The next question is from Blast King and Blast King says, I studied in the US but am no longer in America. Can I apply for the US patent pro bono program from outside the US. This comment was left on a recent YouTube video that I published explaining and describing the United States Patent Pro Bono Program. And the answer to your question, Blast King, that unfortunately, residents living outside of the United States are generally not eligible for the United States Patent Pro Bono Program. This pro bono program is designed to assist under-resourced inventors in the United States and is regionally administered. In each region of the country, there's an independently operated organization that manages the program, and you enter the program through that organization. And unless you or your business is located within that region, there's no way for you to gain access to this pro bono program.
Yamir the Pure asks, so when registering a copyright, do I use my real name or my artist name? And since I'm recording music vocally, what do I choose other than sound recording? Thanks for the question, Yamir. And the answer to the first question is that you can use either your artist name or your real name when registering your work. When registering your vocal music, you'll want to use sound recording as the choice for registration. You should also consider registering the lyrics and the composition as a musical work if you were the author of these. This dual registration gives you the most comprehensive coverage. Trin Yuen writes, I'm the original inventor of a granted patent that expired over seven years ago due to a missed maintenance fee. I only recently learned about 37 CFR 137B and the two-year window for revival. Is there any legal strategy or precedent for reviving a patent beyond that time frame due to extreme hardship and lack of knowledge? Would love any insight or direction. Thank you for sharing this. Yes, there is a pathway for potentially getting your abandoned patent revived. Several years ago, I made a detailed video on this topic. You can go to YouTube and search how to revive a dead patent. You should still be able to find my video via search. But the short answer is yes, it is possible to revive an abandoned patent that was abandoned due to failure of paying a maintenance fee so long as the abandonment was unintentional. Where the abandonment is less than two years, normally all you need to do is petition for revival for reinstatement of the patent, pay the back maintenance fees, and then pay the reinstatement fee required by the patent office. Where the abandonment occurred more than two years ago, the patent office may require you to explain why you unintentionally allowed the patent to go abandoned. Since your patent went abandoned more than seven years ago, you may want to go back to your patent counsel and ask for help in preparing this petition for revival. My experience has been that the patent office is going to want you to explain how the abandonment occurred, why it was in unintentional, that is, how did the unintentionality happen? For example, maybe your patent attorney passed away, I hope not, or perhaps you moved and the notice that you otherwise would have received was, was not forwarded properly to you and you didn't realize that the abandonment had occurred. But the point is you'll want to have some reason why there was an un unintentional abandonment and how that reason stretched from the time of the abandonment to the time of this current petition. And as a general rule, not having the funds at the time the abandonment occurred is not unintentionality. Now there might be some way to artfully make this excuse work, but by and large my experience has been that the patent office is going to want a better excuse than I just didn't have the money. Again, my advice is that if abandonment occurred more than two years ago, you should get help from your patent attorney in preparing this petition to revive. Okay, next question. Adernux writes, if you have multiple variations of a product idea, things that are quite different in design methods, say for example, something like a bicycle design with two variations, a front wheel drive and a rear wheel drive, but they're both still bicycles and are made to function as such, then can the two or three such variations be included in a single provisional patent application? Or would you need different applications for different designs? The answer to this question is yes, you can include multiple designs, multiple embodiments in a single provisional patent application. It's important to clearly and completely describe each of the embodiments that you want to ultimately protect. Now, although it's okay to include related embodiments in the same patent application, you don't want to include unrelated embodiments, unrelated inventions in the same application. The reason for this is that when you file your non-provisional patent applications later, when you convert the provisional patent application to the non-provisional application, both inventions will be ultimately disclosed 
when you pursue the non-provisional application. And so if you later decide to pursue the bicycle and set the fajita machine aside for later patenting, perhaps you haven't finished design of the fajita machine or you're gonna back burner that one for a while, you'll wanna maintain trade secret protection in that. And so you'll not wanna include that in the same provisional patent application as the bicycle. If you're curious at all about provisional patent applications or even thinking about maybe writing your own or filing your own provisional patent application, I'd like to invite you to check out my new book on Amazon. The book is entitled Patent Pending. It's in its 17th edition and it's a step-by-step -step guide to provisional patent applications, how to write your own, how to file your own. It's available in paperback or in Kindle version. It's actually free in Kindle Unlimited. At the end of the book, there's a sample provisional patent application, as well as some sample agreements, a non-disclosure agreement, as well as some letters that are useful if you're thinking about licensing or finding a licensee for your invention. I have a link in the description section below. Thanks for checking it out. Okay, that's all the questions and answers for today. If you have comments, leave them in the comments section below. We'd love to read your questions and comments. If you need help with your company's patent portfolio or your company's patent strategy, email me at this email address. In the meantime, I'll see you on the next video.